Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and I am here with Pastor Ken Warline, who just uh, finished the fourth and final part of the Overcome series. Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here with us sure. today. Today's sermon was particularly challenging because we were focused on uh, Satan, which yeah. is a very uh, kind of confusing and um, troubling, divisive figure, troubling figure uh, throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of questions come in. And so um, we'll start off uh, here with a, a question about... Um, anger in scripture. Um, this person uh, sees Jesus um, and he has this righteous anger at times um, in the gospels and then he sees throughout the Old Testament um, God gets angry uh, quite often with Israel and so his question is to what extent is anger considered bad for us um, according to scripture? Yeah and, and what the questioner is referring to is the middle point where we were talking about not giving the devil a foothold exactly. um, as Ephesians 4 says. Well so I, th I mean, anytime we see God, be well, first of all, l l I think we've got to let God be God. Right. But if we were to do a little analysis, God's anger is always at sin, rebellion against him. And these are the things that uh, upset him. Uh, I think probably let's take the camera off of God and put it onto ourselves. So how do we know if our anger is a righteous anger, a right anger, or a wrong anger? I think the answer is, let's look at what is it leading to? Um, so I think of William Wilberforce, who was angry about uh, slavery. Right. Well, he channeled that, and, and slavery was sin, and he could see all of that and, and, and put all of his time and energy and life into dismantling that system. And so there was anger used in a godly sort of way. Now, I'm sure that there were many people who had slaves who were angry at Wilberforce or at their slaves. That's a different subject. Right. That's not godly anger. So what is it leading to? Um, where is it coming from in your soul and is it is it driven against sin and are you just stewing in it or are you allowing God to use it to be channeled into ways that could be constructive um, in eliminating whatever you know sin right. it is that's upsetting you. Right. I think we have to be careful because I think a lot of times though we assume that our anger is righteous. Right. And so we hear about a friend who said this to that, this is godly anger. Nah, I don't know that that's godly anger. I think that may just be you. <laughs> and that might be something you need to surrender because you don't know all stores, all sides of that story. You weren't there. You love your friend. You're going to hear it through his or her, you know, lens. But I think we need to be careful to too quickly categorize our anger is a godly or a righteous anger. Right, yeah, there's a big difference between righteous anger and then selfish anger. Sure. And one leads to the kingdom and then one leads to a foothold, right? Yeah. And uh, speaking of footholds, there was uh, another question that came in that was, they wanted to know practical, uh, as they put it, shoe leather ways um, to shut those, those windows that we may have left open. Um, right. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd like to think <laughs> that I, got it distilled down towards the end of the sermon as, as clearly as I could. Let me hit those again. We've got the resource of prayer. We've got God's word. Right. We've got community. So let's get even more concrete. You're in the throes of temptation right now. What do you do? Close your eyes for a second and just say, okay, Lord, now I need your strength. I need your grace. I need your fortification because I'm being tempted in this moment. Number two, call your Christian brother or sister, if you're a lady, up. Your accountability partner, your, your friend from your grow group or whatever. Say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling those feelings. I've got that temptation. Pray for me. Uh, right now, just there's something about speaking it aloud of just exactly. it just kind of pops the balloon 
um, if we'll get it out in the open, confessing, as James said, confessing our sins uh, so that we might be healed to one another, so that we might be healed. Um, so confess it, get God's word into it. Either you type up a list or write down a list of here's my top 10 favorite verses on temptation, uh, reminding yourself, um, you know, here's what God's word says, or have your friend read those to you in that moment. Um, or even just say, if it's really, you know, you're, uh, would you come over? or let me come over to your house just so I'll know that I'll not do what I'm being tempted to do. Right. Well, hopefully that's shoe leather enough. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Especially the confession part, that can be so tough to do because it, oh, a lot yeah. of us feel Well, because we're shame. proud. Right, we're, we're proud, proud, exactly. But that's actually one of the most helpful absolutely. tools we have for shutting those windows. Absolutely. Uh, that's excellent. Getting it out in the open. Absolutely. Um, all right, so our next question uh, is, is kind of a, philosophical question about Satan. If Satan was defeated on the cross, sure. um, then why is it that he still has power to this day? Yeah, right. Well, theologians refer to um, th this as the already, not yet. It's already happened, right. as I tried to illustrate towards the end of the message. Jesus, when he came onto this scene of earth, he began to, to do uh, warfare against the powers of darkness and the, the, his kingdom was coming and inaugurated and started and the demons were shrieking back. It's, it's not time yet and you know, these sorts of things. So it has started, but it hasn't been completed yet. And that'll happen on that final day where, where as C.S. Lewis said, uh, that there will be no more deciding that day, right. that, that, that time will be passed. And so we live in this middle time uh, between the, the, the commencing of his kingdom, but not the consummation of his kingdom. Uh, so they call it, uh, theologians tend to refer to this. The, so we live in the already, not yet. Right. So the devil has already been defeated, right. but he's not yet uh, laid out. Here's an example. I was uh, thinking about how um, in our garden, I don't know, about a year ago, a s snake came along. Mm -hmm. The boys were so excited. <laughs> I was a little bit terrified because it was, it was a good sized snake. Right. And I don't know a good snake from a bad snake. So in my book, they're all bad. Sure. So I got the hoe out and I went to town and took the head of that snake off and the boys were fascinated and <laughs> took my phone and showed pictures. And, well, even when the head was off, the tail was still moving, which was kind of freaky because I'm thinking, okay, is another head gonna pop out? And, you know, how does this work? You know, and, well, in the nervous system of a snake, it just, it takes a while for the message to get all the way down, right. you're dead. Well, in a similar way, that's how Satan is. I mean, it's, it's over, he's lost, sure. but he's still thrashing around and gonna do as much damage as possible um, in this time of waiting, but already not yet. Right, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, even thinking about how you said his kingdom was inaugurated here, mm -hmm. but then it'll be fully uh, consummated when he returns, yeah. right? The wedding feast. And, but even right now, we also have a responsibility in, in building that kingdom Absolutely. in that building process. And that's what we need to put yeah. our minds on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a Expansion great way of thinking of, of it. Kingdom. Absolutely. And then uh, another question about Satan. Um, this person said they always thought of the devil of being both of hell and of earth at the same time. Um, so the question was, so is Satan not in hell yet? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and that probably was not made, I probably didn't speak that, uh, the way that I wanted to say that as clearly as I would have liked to have said. It ties into what we were just talking about. So in this already not yet, he's thrashing about here on earth. Right. Where's command central? I've t I tend to think of him as hell, although there's a lot of evidence. Oh, he's right here. And in several instances, you read about how he's uh, the, uh, the, the, the prince of this world and these sorts of things. So he's very much here, but we know ultimately he'll be fully 
there. Right. Um, but since I haven't been, I can't exactly tell where he is. And so that probably, I, I probably spoke uh, something that is a little bit, that, that's complex. Absolutely. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, there's a lot we know about Satan. There's a lot we don't know about Satan, too, right. at the same time. Um, this was, uh, we got another question um, that said, they were wanting to know, how can you tell when slash if you have fully surrendered something to God? Sure. Look at the fruit. Right. I mean, um, what is coming out of you is... Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, uh, forgiveness, um, mercy? Uh, you know, are these things coming out of you? Right. If so, and you're not just contriving that up, just, but it's really coming out of you, then it sounds like you've surrendered. Um, on the other hand, where there's the root of bitterness right. uh, or anger or lust, it, uh, um, somebody who's really in your life close up is going to be able to say, there's inconsistency here. Right. This, is the, you, you, this aspect of your life is not surrendered. Yeah. And you need to be real before God about this and let go of this. That's helpful. Yeah, so if you see those, those uh, things sprouting in your life that aren't of the, of the Spirit, sure. like fear, anger, jealousy, lust, then... Yeah. The proof is in the fruit. Yeah, exactly. what's, what's, coming, what's bubbling out? Yeah, that's, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last question, um, they want to know, how is it that... Um, is it possible, I guess, for Satan to influence Christians sure. if we have the Holy Spirit? Is yeah. that possible? Yeah. Yeah, right. And... Uh, you, in the literature, you can read all sorts of things. People like to parse out possession, um, oppression, um, you know, and, and say, well, you can be this, but you can't be that if you're a Christian. You can be not possessed, but you could be oppressed. And I read an illustration that, that I'll just personalize because I think it, it answers this just very concretely and, and, and helpfully. Suppose, well, first of all, I own the home that, that we live in. So I could bring here the, the title and the deed. Right. Boom, there it is. Now you see it. Now suppose for the sake of illustration, uh, one day in the winter, uh, the doorbell rang and uh, a, a guy or two are standing there shivering and they say, hi, uh, we don't have a place to stay. We hear that you're a pastor and so we assume you're nice because our pastor is supposed to be nice. You know, and could we just stay here for the night? We're not harmful people. We're not going to hurt your family. You know, would you just give us a shelter? Just suppose I was of a notion to say, all right, just go in this room, stay on the sofas, don't go out of the room. And then tomorrow you're on your own. Right. Suppose they said, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. But suppose the next day they said, you know, thank you so much. That was you know, tonight it's supposed to be even colder. Um, one more night, maybe? Right. And suppose I said, okay, one more night. And then suppose they did that the next day and the next day and the next day and for weeks. And now it's been a month or two months or three months until finally my boys and wife are like, for crying out loud, when are you going to get these guys out of here? Right. They, they, they're calling this place home now. Right. We're getting their mail, you know, and, and, and so... Who would be to blame for that? Well, I would have. Right. Why? I cracked open the door. I didn't just crack open the door. I opened right. the door and just let them come right in. And I think that's a good picture for what we who love Christ do. Mm -hmm. And we say, well, just one look. Eh, what harm could that do? Right. Um, or one little angry meltdown, it just feels so good. And, you know, and, or any number of things. Right. I rattled off a bunch, workaholism and our image control and our popularity, and we get fixated on it. Any of these can serve to just open the door and he just comes walking right in and we'll try to 
nest and stay and not leave. Right. And I think that's where we just have to have eyes wide open, um, our spiritual eyes wide open to, to just see more clearly. Absolutely. He He's always ready to, to right. come in when we'll even just barely crack the door open. Absolutely. Well, that's why it's so important to practice self-discipline too, because it's so easy to compromise sure. on sin and to just think it's not really that big of a deal, but then it turns into a very big deal before it. you know it. Yeah. Destroys many a life. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for sure. joining us, and thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org/postscript.